Yeah. Well, here we are again for another edition of Tales from the Mile of Gold. And uh, today we sit down with Mike Sutton representing the mining industry. Thanks for doing this, Mike. Hey, pretty good. Prospector, Thanks. all-star prospector. Can I call you that? No, but, you know, I'm okay. Well, you're on, you're on my list of all-stars when it comes okay. to prospecting. Right on. First question, um, I'm from the Montreal area. You're from the Ottawa Valley. People know how I wound up here. How'd you wind up up here? Uh, I was, uh, well, I, I have a, a wife, right? And, yes. uh, so Mary, a very nice wife too. Yeah. And so she's graduating from dentistry and she, at the time I'm working at a mine up in Wawa, the Renabi okay. mine. And she goes and says, oh, I got a job in Kirkland Lake. And I, she'd never been North Hunt, Huntsville is Northern, Northern Ontario, okay. the North, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm going, well, I was expecting her to go to Sudbury or Timmins or yeah. Thunder Bay or something. I get a job nearby, but Kirkland Lake, I didn't. So the only two mines in the area that were operating at the time was uh, the Kerr and, and McCassin. and hadn't hired anybody in, since Jesus was a cowboy exactly. sort of thing, right? So I didn't think I'd be able to get, get a job around here. And it was like that week when she told me uh, there, there was a, they were a uh, new mine, Hope McDermott, mm -hmm. and they were hiring a geologist. And uh, I think it was 115 people applied, and I was the only one who actually showed up at the mine site. Ah, guess who got the job? I guess. <laughs> I guess. We're glad you're here. So what spurred your interest in geology as a, as a young man? Uh, to be honest, I wasn't interest in geology. I went to university for something else. And, well, how'd you fall into it then? I, I don't know. I was sitting around with the boys and uh, I didn't like what I was in and said, Jesus, it's got to be something better. And and one guy says, well, I took a geology course. It's really fun. You should take it. And I did. And I haven't looked back. <laughs> it was good. Go so, see the world. So you came here that your first job was at Holt McDermott? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that's you know that's a lot of driving on the gravel roads there. I was about to say a lot of flat tires. This yeah. is when it was gravel, mm -hmm. and it was. Uh, I still remember they had, there was guys working up there. I, by the way, I was first one to get an SUV, right? I had the, I had the Jeep Cherokee when they first came out, the four liter <laughs> engine. That was the first SUV, and so within so you're a big shot. Well, within. I bet you within four months there was seven or eight of them up there. <laughs> Bond Brothers was selling them like hotcakes because, uh, but still you'd be getting flat tires. Yeah, but that yeah. was that gravel road. People were burning rubber up that thing. That was there harsh. was you never had too many police on there, and <laughs> and the boys. There's well, I was going to tell you about some of the people in mining. One of them is uh, is uh, the best raised miner ever, uh, Roger Lazat. He lives in town here. Okay. Right? And Roger, his partner was the animal, eh? and the animal he had blue eyes like a husky yeah. dog. Uh, I, I can't remember what his real name was, but he, he looked like uh, sort of, uh, oh, what's the name of the guy in California who was uh, crazy, was in jail there and uh, murdered a bunch Not of people. Charles Manson. Yeah, he looked just like that. So <laughs> that was the, yeah, he was the animal. <laughs> so they were partners and those guys would get there around and they'd be done by like one o'clock in the afternoon. They'd be on their way home. And they, you know, they blasted after mm -hmm. shift, eh? But those guys, I mean, I think they made, we, we used to have sort of a, a race and it was like, I think it was 25 minutes to get to the railway tracks in town. It was the best. <laughs> like their back wheels would be right off the road, eh? You could probably fry an egg on the tires. Oh, they, I'm telling you. There was a lot of accidents too on that road. There was, uh, and we named the corners after people who went down. There was uh, some guys from New Zealand went down the one hill there, so we call that one Kiwi Corner. And then uh, Sue Teagues went off another one, so we call that one Suicide Corner. Suicide. Oh yeah, Suicide Corner. And then anyway, there's it, a lot of accidents and this and that. It was, it was a lot of stories there, but anyway, that, uh, that, was, a, was, a good, uh, that was a good place to work. Uh, and, uh, but then I got on at Macassa there. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, that was really good. Like Lack Minerals, great company to work for. Eh? Not too many companies that people look back and say, "Yeah, that was a great that company." Was a great company. Yeah, that's that's yeah. very true. And in mining, there's even fewer companies. I think uh, you know, Placer, before it was Placer Dome, was one. I hear Agnico's a great company to okay. work for. So there's certain companies. Uh, uh, 
uh, Walker and Gold was great when I was working for him, <laughs> but I don't know what it's like now, but it was really okay, good. Okay, so let's talk about your days in McCaslin. Um, who were some of the other prospectors at the time? Oh yeah, there's some guy. There are a lot of prospectors. Curtin Lake's probably the best, you know, the biggest center of prospecting in the province, and uh, a lot of really good guys come out of here. Geologists, part-time prospectors, mm -hmm. pure prospectors. I mean, you know, like everybody. Well, because of the hundredth anniversary, they know all about the old guys, yeah, exactly. right? Exactly. Uh, you know. Famous like Bill Wright, you know, mm -hmm. Gold Mill and everything, and Sherry Oaks, richest man in the world, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But there's a lot of really good guys, uh, it, it, you know, since then too. Like and good characters, right? Like you guys, everybody. Well, if you're old enough, you, you'd know a lot of these guys. A lot of them have passed away, but like, uh, you know, you had uh, uh, you had Alex uh, and John. You know that they they had the uh, they had the uh, Curatus in there for a oh, yeah. while. Definitely. Yeah, and uh, Alex was, uh, you know, he, he's a one, man. He's there's a million stories just about him. But the he, prospectors I've run across and I've met and or heard stories about, they all have a similar trait in that they're characters. Oh yeah, they're characters. Some of these to guys. Me, to me, it has to. It's a special breed of character. So, like, I'll, I'll give you an example of a, good, a real character, right? So, Carl Forbes. Now, yes. Carl Forbes. Well, Carl was my neighbor for years. Yeah, I mean, and you know them, yes. right? <laughs> like, the guys, like, like, he was a millionaire, what, three times, and mm -hmm. the guy uh, wore a kilt. Yes. Wore a kilt. <laughs> Didn't look like a Scotsman much. Uh, but he wore a kilt. <laughs> but he wore, he wore a, kilt. a kilt. He's a native guy, right? But he's really good guy. And he's one of the great characters. Yeah, and he used to beat all the big companies in these these staking rushes, right? So the big boys, like I remember, there's uh, there's a bunch of them, but there was a couple famous ones. Uh, Tomogamy, when it came open, it had been closed for years, mm -hmm. and the government lifted the the closure. So there's a big rush, and it's like everybody, it's first one to get done, mm -hmm. and you you. Now everything's online. Um, yeah. So, but then, uh, and this, you know, up until a couple of years ago, you you would go in the bush and you'd stake your claims. You'd cut tre four trees down on the one quarter mile uh, 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 apart from one another and a square, and you'd put your tag on the posts, right? And you'd write down your name and all this other mm -hmm. uh, information, and you'd and you'd you know blaze the trees on the way so you could see the trail. So anyway, in a rush situation, you're allowed to have the post done ahead of time and you have it laying there, but you have to put it up okay. and you have to put the tag on, you have to write everything down. Yeah. So anyway, Carl, his guys used to beat all the big boys, all the big companies that come in, his guys would beat them. And they'd come in with track teams. They'd go and clear it out. They'd have these young guys from the universities or the, and uh, these guys are the fastest guys in the province. Like crazy. And Carl had the old old fellows from town yeah. here who are the best bush guys around, exactly. right? Like George Harkin's crew there, George Sadik, well, George Sadik, we not so fast, but, <laughs> but <laughs> well, like Mike days. Barrett and, yeah, and Mookie and all yeah. these guys, like they would, they would beat these young guys. So mm -hmm. what happens is one time they got, it's winter, they're out there and uh, and they're and sure enough, they're beating. Uh, I forget who it was though, who was uh, doing doing the the claim, this particular claim, and he's ahead of these young guys, way ahead. But for whatever reason, he gets disoriented and he goes down. Instead of turning at the post and going to the next post, he goes because because there's all yeah, yeah. It keeps going. And then when he realizes, now he doubles back. By now, the young guys are ahead of him. He's freaking out. He's running as fast <laughs> as he can. He has a little box of nails. His nails drop out. And you need the nails to put the tag on. Yes. Sure enough, he gets to the post. He's in such a hurry. He puts the post up. He goes to put the, and he and he using. He doesn't have nails, so he's using his 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 axe to cleave in the okay. the, the 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 aluminum like, tag yeah. there. Cuts his thumb off, doesn't he? Eh? So what happens is the other guys come in there and now. Well, they're not going to get the claim. But they got to find his thumb, find right? So they can go and glue, you know, not glue it back on, so but stoves, yeah, and all that. So they're looking, looking, 20 minutes, can't find it, and the one guy finds it. It's still frozen. It was on the, on the, on the axe. It's still stuck on the axe. 
And then Buddy goes and takes it, puts it in his pocket, and he's got all kinds of dirt in there, and then it got infected, and it was no good. You couldn't put it back on, right? But, uh, yeah, well, yeah, there's lots of good stories out in the bush like that. Like, uh, Well, I want to backtrack a little bit, um, because we, we assume everybody watching this is a minor. For the folks that, Kurt and Mike, there's people that run across this video, um, let's give them a bit of an education now. A mining claim, how do you go about, or what is a mining claim? Why are you staking out these plots of land? Is there, what's the hierarchy? Is it who gets there first? Uh, how long is the claim in your possession for? Um, yeah, well. Walk us through it all. It's all changed, eh? Like now, it's well, all on you, a computer. When you started? Like the last ones I just staked was with my neighbors uh, in, in my man cave so next to the beer fridge with a computer. A fast online connection. Yeah, but you can stake if it's not a staking rush, like if it's not just coming open yeah. that day, you can just do it whenever you want. So you just sit there by the beer fridge and you got to okay. have a real good finger. That's all. But in the old days, of course, up until now, mm -hmm. it was first man to get done. Well, in the old days, it was first man back to, to the, the mining post? recorder. Okay, okay. But then they changed it. It's just uh, uh, to sign the last post. Uh, and, and then, then you got the claim. Um, so, uh, and you'd get, you know, like I remember staking, uh, I staked, I got a big, uh, uh, you can stake uh, one quarter by one quarter mile by one quarter mile. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that's in kilometers, but anyway, I'm old. <laughs> but then, or you could do like bigger block, okay. right? And so this one big company in, in they were, it was a staking rush that they did like a block of 16. I got the block the one claim right in the middle, yeah. right? And it was the important one. It had drill holes already on it and it had gold on it. That's the one they really wanted, but they went and staked the whole big thing. So it was like a donut, but we got, I, so I got done you, first. You in the I had the, yeah. So they, the rest wasn't worth much. So then they uh, sold that and it was uh, Stewie Carmichael and myself split it. He got a nice guitar out of it. And uh, I forget what I bought, an outboard motor, I think. Might've been beer. Could have been beer, have been but beer. it was, uh, you, you know, so anyway, the thing is, if you stake a claim, mm -hmm. like I'll give you an example. I staked some claims up near Goodfish there. And if you stake the right claims at the right time and you know, it's it, it, like these ones, it didn't cost much. It's 10 bucks a claim back in the old day. And I got three claims and it was a beautiful sunny day, but it was another stake and rush. Everybody was up at Harker Holloway okay. with better claims. Mm -hmm. and it was just me there. I didn't have any competition. I staked it. And then over the years, I optioned it to a company because okay. you get to hold it for two years. Uh, I was about to ask yeah. you that. Two you years. get to hold okay. it for two years, but you got to do work on it. If you don't do any, then it comes open again. At the end of two years? Yeah. Okay. But if you do work on it. Then you hold it. You can hold it forever, forever. as long as okay. you keep doing the work. Okay. So anyway, uh, those are regular state claims. Then you have patented claims, which you can just buy. But the patents, the government doesn't give out patents anymore. They're pretty rare. But now, and what happens why you get these staking rushes is people don't pay their taxes on the patented claims. They revert back to the crown, okay. and all of a sudden they're open for the first time in 80 years, let's okay. say. Okay, that, that was another question. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, but it, you can make a lot of money on, on staking claims, and a lot of people do that just as a hobby. Uh, order, you get a prospector's license and you're you're allowed to state claims oh and you're allowed to blast too now how do you determine where you're going to go to state your claims well you know right. there's how much how much research and background information knowledge goes into this yeah you know that's because i'm a geologist it's a little easier but even like uh, anybody, off, you know, wants to get into it, it's not that difficult. Like the easiest thing you can do is just figure out if you hear about it or you read the Northern Miner or mm -hmm. you just happen to know somebody is drilling in such and such a location, state the claims nearest to it. That's all you need to know. So uh, because if they hit something good, mm -hmm. all the claims around is going to be worth gonna, something, yeah. right? So, but uh, usually what you're looking for for gold is structure. So you've heard of the Kirk Lake main break. Yes. It's a fault, like the San Andreas fault. Mm -hmm. And the fluids came up with the gold 
and and that and like the the Larder Lake break goes for hundreds of miles wow. and all the way from Val d'Or all the way through Metach and there's mines all the way along it yeah. Desta Porcupine you look at all the mines they're all they're not perfectly in a straight line but they're kind but, of yeah. along where the highways are so highway 101 mm -hmm. is the Desta Porcupine goes all through Timmins all the mines there keeps going so you, you try to get something along those two is usually a good idea. You've mm -hmm. got a better chance of finding gold. And then there's other things you look for. Uh, but, you know, it's, so, not, it's not as difficult as people think, though. So you stake... Uh, oh, by the way, you could just stake a, an old shaft. There's shafts that are they're open. You can go stake them. I just did that a couple of days ago, by so the way. So in order to determine... Uh, whether a plot of land is open or not, I, I assume there's an online registry. Yeah, it's or... online. You go on there and you can see well, what's see open, what's all, not. Where all the claims are. Yeah, yeah. So it's, yeah, it's not as... All right, so while we're on the staking subject, back in the day, you are tramping through the bush and... Well, and you got to watch out for freaking bears, of course. Well, of course, you got to deal with the wildlife. And, uh, well, course. yeah, I mean, bears and, by the way, wolves, too. too. You're on their turf. Stewie, Stewie Carmichael was up on 101. He's in a tent, like one of those white, mm. you know, prospector tents. And, you know, with the door and, the, and it's winter time and he's by himself. And there's, uh, you know, you can hear the wolves howling and then they're closer and closer. Next thing you know, they're going around his tent. Mm -hmm. So he didn't sleep that night and he had his, he had his repex and he had a lighter. So they come through the door, it's like it's a, well, that's like a, a flamethrower, yeah. right? So yeah, you get situations like that. But the bears, you know, if you're in the bush, everybody around here knows about, you know, but I always, like I carry a, one of those little music things that's really loud and I got okay. the Guns and Roses just a blasting, <laughs> hoping that the bears aren't attracted to that. Uh, who I wonder, wouldn't be? I, I wonder if Axl Rose knows his stuff is being used as bear repellent. Oh, yeah, I know. It, but it, it's, it's not really for the bears, it's for the hunters, because the hunters are, yeah. are more of a problem than the bears. You, you know, they're going to shoot at anything that moves. And you don't really want to be in a bush when the hunting season, because you know they might have partaken of a little of this and that. Stuff they shouldn't be doing. There you go. With firearms. Yeah. Okay, so back in the day, you're tramping through the bush, aware of wolves and bears and wildlife around you as you're, uh, as you're uh, nailing your plate to your post. Yeah. Today, yeah, it's how do you just, do it? You just do it online. Do you it just, online. Yeah, you got to get a prospector's license, which I forget what it costs, not much. And then you, you know, you just, any, then you're, you're a prospector. You can go and state claims. And, uh, you, you know, and like I say, it's, I don't know. I'm old school, so I don't like it. I like the old way mm. it was. And the reason I liked it the old way it was is because the people who stake claims, if you didn't stake yourself and you got someone else to do it, regardless of whether it's you or the people who, because the people I used to hire to go and stake some claims, if I wasn't doing it, mm. uh, while they're going through, they're picking up rocks and they see something here, see something there. They bring back the samples. If I'm there, I'm checking everything yeah. out. If you're doing it online, you're never setting foot in the That's bush. Right. And the odds are there's not going to be any work ever done on that claim, mm -hmm. you know? So it's, I don't know, it, it's taken away a whole livelihood from all the uh, line, well, the, the, the stakers for one. So but back in the day, it's easier. when you were in the bush staking claims, how often... How time consuming is this? How much time do you spend out in the bush staking claims? That's oh, well, it doesn't, schedule. you know, people, some guys are really fast at doing it because you got to blaze and you got to be good with an ax. Mm -hmm. Just cutting a tree down. And you don't just cut any tree. It's got to be, the, the posts at the end had to be four inches by four inches square. Okay. And so you had to do a fair sized tree. And you had to, you know, you, there's a lot of things you got to think about. You can't just be going through someone's backyard, cutting down a tree, yeah. putting a post up. So, you know, you got to know what's private land, what's not, mm -hmm. what, this and that, just put flag and tape. Well, back and that. in the day, before everything was computerized and online, how did you acquire this information? How do you know whether you're on my property or whether this is open land or crown land or? Well, you got to look that up. <laughs> you know, so, but 
you know, a lot, a lot of the ground around here, most of it is 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 crown land. Mm -hmm. But if it's patents, then you know it's private. Okay. So you know you, you well, you're not staking private uh, patented. It's already patented. It's already patented. Right. But but if you've got houses or you know you know if there's any buildings anywhere, you you just got you got to be careful what you do. But uh, it's just common sense. Like there's some things that you know, like you say, there's it's it's. There is some danger in doing prospecting. There was a time, I think it was about 20 years ago, there was a, a shaft that this prospector was pumping the, you know, you, mm -hmm. it fills back with water. Well, he's pumped the water out. He's gone back, he's gone down there after a certain amount. Of, anyway, he, he got asphyxiated and then his partner sees him down there. He went down and he got like, oh, it's no. yeah, so they didn't make it. So it's like, you you know, there's some, I got that underground, like you can get gassed underground and you don't see the mm -hmm. fumes or anything. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, you know, all of a sudden you're just getting dizzy and yeah. you. I, By which time it's probably too late. Right? Well, no, it's, you can still be like, when I, I got gassed the one time I was, uh, it was, it was a dead end. I went up into an air and it was, there's no air movement. Nobody mm -hmm. had the ventilation on, I guess. And I sampled, but it was clear you couldn't see anything couldn't smell anything i was coming down the ladder all of a sudden i was getting dizzy i get to the bottom the guy's on the slusher and he sees me and he goes are you okay and i go sure and i go to grab the pipe and i misses oh, no. missed it you know you brought me up to surface and they give you the oxygen eh? Mm -hmm. oh that's the best thing ever <laughs> i don't know if you've ever had oxygen but no, it I've is never, I've never it's like experienced it's like you can that. taste the the air it's just so good I, that's why the athletes do it all the time they have them at bars too you can i do things you learn Who yeah Who well, there you go i had one time i tell you underground is is no you know it's dangerous too now the one thing is and people don't know this i guess most people but um mining is actually safer than agriculture well, way let's, safer let's, let's talk let's talk about that because We've heard stories um, back in the day of really a lack of safety issues, um, guys getting hurt and whatnot. But yeah. today, no, it's, it's 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 come full circle oh, as yeah. far as safety goes. So explain some of the safety measures that have wow. been incorporated. Yeah, over the years. here's the thing, like. Like I, you know, because again, I'm old, so I know what it was like in the mm -hmm. old days, but. It, you know, and what goes on underground stays underground, but so I'm not gonna go into some details here, but in general, like it's, sa it's safer than the agriculture, it's safer than uh, the lumber, timber industry, mm -hmm. you know, it's safer than, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's safer than working in most, in fact, in, you know, a factory job. Yeah. Uh, so uh, now when there is an accident, it can be bad, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's, it's uh, I remember there was a story in Africa where there was, uh, a cage and it, it was a double decker cage mm -hmm. two cages that's like an elevator double decker and then what happened was uh i don't know what happened the guy in the, on the hoist he's in charge you don't bother that guy mm -hmm. uh the only you know you talk to him with these 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 signals with a it's a it's a bell and you you know contact him that way okay and you, nobody you know he the guy cannot be a party or he can't be mm -hmm. there hung over or anything Anyway, this guy, I don't know if he had maybe a stroke or something. Anyway, he was bringing the cage up and he didn't stop it at the, when it came to surface. It just kept going up, up, and it snapped the line and went all the way down, yeah. So those guys didn't, didn't make it, all right? A couple guys tried to jump out as the levels went by, but mm -hmm. it's going it's almost pretty bad, yeah. And it went down like 5,000 feet. Uh, so, so that would, you know, that's, there's quite a few guys who was, uh, were on those cages but you know nowadays it's like i say it's so safe mccasa used to well in town here all those bumps that used to they're came, still they're still bumps when i first but not at Macassa so much when i first came to town which is 30 odd years ago mm. there was lots of bumps um mm. i don't think i'm telling tales out of school if i if i say that Macassa did not have the greatest reputations no no 35 40 years ago yeah so like we used to have bumps all the time now bumps Again, you'd say, well, there's not much you can do well, about explain, it, explain but there what a bump is. is. For people that don't know. Well, a bump is like, because uh, of the pressure in the rocket, the deeper you go, there's more and more pressure. So if you have an opening, uh, if it's a small opening, it, it's usually pretty good. You're not, but if it's a big opening, 
then the pressures build up and, and you'll get the walls or the floor can come up. Can come up, yeah. Uh, I, I've seen where rail, a rail line is up at the, at the back. That's wow. the roof for people at the back. So anyway, the, so, uh, but you know, you, you'll get a massive, like, like an earthquake size seismicity, you know, mm -hmm. like on the Richter scale, some of these can be really high. And so we've had that in town here since, you know, uh, I don't know, probably the 30s or 40s when they got deep in the mines. Uh, and, you know, the whole town can feel them. And they're still, the, they still happen in the old parts of the mine. But here's the thing. If you don't have the openings, then you don't have this, you won't have the bumps. Yeah. So what you have now is pace fill. And it's oh, okay. great. And, and it, some of the guys in town here, like... Uh, 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 Jim Naylor and 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 Paul and Tony Azzi there, and they they started this, and then they and now it's everywhere around the world. But you, you use the uh, tailings and mm -hmm. then mix it with some cement, pump it back underground, fill up fill the voids. The In the old days, they tried to fill the voids because they were having bumps. They used sand from Crystal Lake. There's a pit there, a sand pit, okay. and they they would bring it in in trains and dump it in, and they did that in Timmins too. The problem is sand isn't quite as good or they use rock fill mm -hmm. not quite as good still have voids still get bumps yeah. it would hold it a little bit better but you would still get the bumps but this it's like it fills everything it's solid, solid right yeah. and that's what you need and the, when the, of course the problem with sand is that once you put water the water comes up once you stop mining mm -hmm. takes all that sand and just right. it just like sugar it goes exactly. all over the place exactly. yeah so all of a sudden now you got voids again so you know and that's where you get like in Timmins, they had, uh, what was that in Schumacher? It was a car dealership, a couple cars went down or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah you know, so you can get that. There, there was sand and all of a sudden there wasn't. I think when I came into town behind the mall, there was uh, sand right up and then it, it had, I don't know, it, a void was created and right in the parking lot there was a little hole there. I remember there. there was a little hole in Chappie Hughes at one point. Yeah, well. Um, so. Well, that sort of brings us to to another topic. My brother-in-law, Gary Grabowski, a longtime geologist, retired geologist, although... You should claims, interview him. He's got a he million claimed, stories. He claims to be working more now than he was when he was actually working. But anyway, um, yeah. we had a chat one day, and he talked about... He was actually talking to somebody else. I was eavesdropping, talking about there's honeycombs. It's like there's all these pockets, the, all these holes that have been mined out hmm. all over Kirkland Lake. And at the time when I'm hearing this, I'm still I'm still a city kid. I haven't got, I haven't yeah. got Kirkland Lake through my body yet. Yeah. And I'm thinking, so wait a minute now. So some of these homes are just built over holes? And he said, basically, well, yeah, kind of. Yeah, and, well. There's but, some, you, you heard the story, or most people have heard that, where the, there was, at Sylvanite, they were drill, they were working underground, and the guys, I don't know if they didn't have good survey control or what, but they came a little too close to surface, so they're drilling off, they're drilling uppers, they call it, so they're going to blast down, drilling in the, and their drill steel went up, and uh, daylighted, it was the railway tracks. <laughs> so you got a stope right on the way, and then there's another stope, right? That's uh, well. Here's it. When I first, Oops. when we started drilling for Kirk and Gold, uh, we were looking for uh, gold that was left behind, and like the mall had nobody in it. There was one company left. Okay. And this was in '99, when the town was like yeah, was... desolate, and it was like you know a lot of all the businesses had closed up. We, we're we wanted to go and mine under the mall because there's a, a there's a lot of ore left behind okay. there. It's not like there's holes coming all over the place though. There's just the odd it's one. Like there's pockets. there's a rays coming up here, and there's a and most of them have concrete, big concrete okay. thing. You know, all the shafts and that big concrete. Uh, there's rehabilitation going on all the time, even to those concrete things to mm. you know make them even stronger. So there's not really a lot of that left, but there still is some. It was a few years ago at the Tolburn, they, the government, because mm -hmm. they ended up with the Tolburn and they had filled in near surface some voids okay. that were a little scary. Um, 
but you know, most most of the time, you you don't have to worry about that in town uh, much anymore. But I know we were we were trying to go and find places where we could mine some easy ore. And uh, guess where the two best places were? We didn't touch them. Beer store, liquor store. We yeah, yeah we didn't want to touch those. We're not going to have everybody in town all so pissed would, off so at that, us. So that would tell me that <laughs> probably under Civic Park could be probably <laughs> well, yeah, there's, lucrative uh, as well. Yeah, well, the BD, the old BDR building, yeah. there's stopes right under that. Well, the Discovery Outcrop. Yeah, it's right there. There's actually a stope under the highway there. But again, oh, yeah. it's, you know, it's been looked after. And, but, you know, there's still some places that aren't, you know, that... Uh, but there's, you know, if you're in the bush, I'll give you an example. There's a, there was a mine south of Larder. I was reading the reports on it, a company, uh, you know, it was from the 1920s or something. Mm -hmm. And the company went in there and did some work, dewatered it. So they get, went down and they found, because uh, the, there was not much of a cover. It was old wooden cover and it half rotted. And they could see there was a hole there. So they went down, they found half a moose on one level and half a moose on the other <laughs> level. You know, So the moose went down, you know. Well, yeah, there's a little bit of that, but anyway. How problems. else has uh, technology changed the way Things oh. done underground. Well, I'll tell you what, like in, when I went to school, in prehistoric days, it was like uh, mainly to, to begin with is mainly guys in geology, engineering, mm -hmm. everything. Now it's more than 50% are women. But anyway, no, it's just, it's good because uh, I guess, I, I don't know, women didn't want to they didn't want to get into the, the sciences, you know, but mm -hmm. I know when I was in school, w women are better at math than guys most. For the most part, yeah. I know. Time. So, and you know, but anyway, it's it's come a long way. Like, uh, you know, you use, nowadays, it's all 3D, everything's computerized. Yeah. You can look in, uh, at everything. And I remember we were doing, um, you know, we were doing, uh, we'd have production meetings. You'd have everybody there for the mine. And you're talking about, okay, how are we going to mine this stope and we have this problem or not? And I, I, I would bring in the each, and I'd have it all there in 3D and rotate around. It's so much easier mm -hmm. to, to look at it and, and go, oh, turn it around. Okay, now there, you know, okay, this is where the problem is, blah, blah, blah. And you, in the old days, it's all a bunch of pieces of paper. Yeah, exactly. You know, it was hard to, uh, hard now, to see things. But yeah, yeah, it's really advanced now. When you went to school, did you learn computers in school, or did you learn yeah. this after you graduated? Oh, I learned computers all right. Cards, decks of cards ah, <laughs> with little ah, holes ah. in them oh, to do oh, one little oh, thing, like a okay, little so we're going sort way program. We're going way back Hell, to, yeah. to day so, one. <laughs> yeah. So, no, I, you know, you learn as you go because everything's advancing so quickly. You have to keep up with it, and so everybody does that. But it's, uh, no, it's good. Like, uh, nowadays, like, even uh, underground... We used to go, and uh, there's still things you have to do the old-fashioned way. Like, I'll tell you what, one of the things that's the oldest thing in the world is, is the way they blast rock. Because it hasn't changed, really, changed. in 100 years. Oh, wow. And, you know, you drill a bunch of holes, you fill it full of explosives, and you blast. And you get six, in the old days, eight feet, because mm -hmm. today everyone's a bunch of wusses, can only get six feet. <laughs> there was a guy... Well, I, I don't, you know, Lincoln McClinchy there, yes. he, he had a partner up in Timmins, mm -hmm. and I forget the guy's name, he had big pop bottle glasses, the big thick glasses like uh, Buddy on, uh, <laughs> on Trailer, on trailer Park. Park Boys, eh? <laughs> bubbles there, he had that bubbles, but this guy was huge, and, and, and Lincoln, this is back in his prime when he was, not a, not a, you're not in your prime anymore, but anyway, but he was like, uh, you know, like he'd come out of a, an eight hour shift just whacked. Mm -hmm. Because they would do 16, they'd double, they would do a double round, oh, wow. 16 feet. They would drill it and blast it. Nowadays, people get six feet. But it's still, it's, it's ancient, the way things are done. The only thing that's changed is like back in the 20s, I guess it was, they went from nitroglycerin to okay. modern explosives. Mm -hmm. And explosives have changed over the years, but still, you're blasting. Nitro, uh, of course... The strange thing about that is that it's uh, Nobel invented it. Peace Prize? He's yes. the guy who invented black, yes. you know, stuff that blows things up. Imagine that. Imagine that. But anyway, so 
they they went and um, you know they still do this. So that hasn't changed, and that will eventually somebody's kind of come up with a better yeah. way to break rock, and you know. But um, if they haven't figured it out in a hundred years, yeah. But you know, like everything now is mechanized. It's like little kids are better off than a lot of these miners with their big thumbs and that. They're just joysticks, yeah. and everything's you know you don't have people on the on the scoops anymore mm -hmm. and they go in there so people don't get hurt as odd if there's a problem mm -hmm. you know it's it's so it's, i was gonna ask when it comes oh to and by the way one of the best new things in mining is from kirk and lake here and it was harry dobson and well it was it was uh, brian hinchcliffe for kirk and gold uh because he was an innovator mm -hmm. and, and a lot of different things like he's the first guy i ever heard of where the you know the mine was you know, paying for doctors to, you okay. know, and this and that, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. But he got uh, the first scoops and big machinery underground uh, on lithium batteries. Oh, okay. That, okay. that started here. That's why they were going to open that big yeah, plant here in town. Yeah, place. Because, and then everybody from around the world, the problem is they didn't have patents on it. So exactly. now everybody else has copied it. Exactly. All the other. Well, that, I, that's where I was going with... Um, the modern technology today, uh, how much of a role is do robotics and electric vehicles play? Well, electric vehicles, like I say, everything. And, you know, the, the reason, there's a lot of reasons to go with the electric vehicles, but the number one is ventilation. Yes. And heat. Mm -hmm. Like, it's so hot underground, it gets hotter as you go, as deeper. You go deeper. Like, I remember on the 7,000 foot level, there is a zone to the north called the old five zone. And as soon as you turn the corner, you'd be head to toe soaked wow. from sweat. It'll be like the hottest sauna you've ever been in. Furnace. Oh, it was I don't know, 140 degrees or wow. something. And, and humid, you know? Mm. So, you know, you can only ventilate so much. And then when you have now, you know, when you have trucks, this was mm. with rail mainly, but when you have trucks, that adds to all the heat uh, big time when you have diesel going yeah. and you know you got to vent all that diesel smoke and everything well now electric it's and it's quiet people love exactly. it exactly right so exactly. it's uh i'm just surprised they you can do a big diesel equipment uh you know with tons of rock in the bucket and yet you can't come up with like a helicopter with a battery like that <laughs> or something you know that's something we can work on uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> now Price of gold at the time we were recording this. Mm -hmm. uh, price of gold this morning was two thousand seven dollars and seven cents Canadian. Yeah, is that the magic number? Two thousand dollars. Well, it, it's for twenty nineteen. It's yeah, it's a magic number for sure. Like all of a sudden, because I work now with junior companies. Now junior companies. Okay, explain explain the difference. Okay, so you have prospectors. Prospectors historically have found the deposits. Yes. Not always. Sometimes companies find the deposits, but prospectors are more tenacious and they just have a nose for it. I'll give you an example. I got a couple guys working for me out in the East Coast that are prospectors. Okay. And I brought them to Finland to a property up there. And in, in the first day, they found the best stuff that's ever been found. The next you know, over a year, they were they had all these students and everybody else running around, still haven't bested what these wow. guys found in one day. So wow. these old guys have a nose for yeah. it, right? And a guy like Mike Leahy, or mm -hmm. even guys who are like uh, part-time prospectors, like Len Cunningham was really, mm -hmm. like he, you know, he's a good, now there's a lot of guys who are really good at finding stuff. But anyway, um, uh, what was they talking about? I don't know. Oh. Oh yeah, so you start with prospectors, your junior, oh, junior companies. Junior companies. So junior companies are the next step up. Uh, they're not big, huge companies, and they don't make any money. People forget that. They keep raising money by putting shares out, and they're hoping to discover something, and then they're hoping a major company, Swallow which is a pretty, swallows them up, yes. or options into the property or something, right? Mm -hmm. So. Uh, and that's how the junior companies make money, and they can you you know junior companies can can do really well. And like Kurgan Gold was a junior company originally; okay. it wasn't like a big company. Mm -hmm. But um, but there's the juniors that do only expiration, and there's other juniors that do 
a bit of mining and exploration, okay. and that's kind of, kind of like what Kirkland Gold was at the start. Now it's mainly a production, you know, major. You it's you, a major now. It's a major now, yes. Yeah, sure. it's like, you and know, you $10 billion dollar company. You're working primarily now with junior companies? Yeah, so junior companies are, are good good to work for, and like I say, they, they're aggressive, and they have to be. Mm -hmm. They have to roll with the punches. And a lot of juniors, some of them, they just sort of go with um, whatever's hot, which I don't think is a good idea. You should stick to your guns. So, like, one year, gold is hot. Right, right now, gold is yeah. hot. But, you know, a couple last year or the year before, cobalt was the big thing. Yeah. The year, a couple years before that, it was lithium because mm -hmm. of lithium batteries. Then it was rare earths. But mm -hmm. a lot of times you can keep changing focus, but you should actually you know, stick with one thing and, and then, and you could do quite well. But then there's other minerals too. We were just talking gold. There's mm -hmm. base metals too, right? Zinc and copper and so, lead and, and diamonds. Don't forget diamonds. In this local area. I was going to ask about diamonds. Diamonds right that's now. That's going to be the next thing, right? I, I mean, it's supposed to be all secret, but De Beers is the biggest diamond company around and uh, they have Atawapiskat. It's, it's not a secret that they've been, they're, they've been they're around. around for a long time. Well, but they, they were here 30 years ago and then again 20 years ago, mm -hmm. but they haven't been back in a long time and there are Kimberlites that host diamonds in the area. And there's one Kimberlite near Twin Lakes okay. and it actually had something like 60 carats, a couple one carat diamonds in it. Oh, wow. So it was really close to being economic, not quite, but mm -hmm. plus there was a diamond found, and they call it, well, they call it the Nipissing diamond. It was found at uh, Sharp Lake, and it was, it depends on who you talk to, it was over 100 carats for sure. Wow. And it was yellow, canary yellow, which is really rare. Mm -hmm. And it sold at Tiffany's, and, and this is back in 1905, so it's over 100 years wow. ago. But it was one of the biggest diamonds in the world ever found. It didn't come from out of Wapiscat. So De Beers is in the area mm. right now, and they got, I, I hear, they got like four helicopters and they got mm -hmm. four drills with each helicopter. They got a drill and they're drilling all over the place. So, you know, again, if you're into trying to prospect, well, you just got to know what to look for. And then, you know, and in the case of Kimberlites, it's really simple because Kimberlites, uh, the rock, the Kimberlite, rock is soft, softer than anything around it normally. Oh, okay. So it erodes, so you almost always get a nice round pond or lake, oh, little, okay. little lake on top of it. Almost always, but not always. So, you've totally confused me now. Okay. Yeah, a hundred things run through my mind. <laughs> so you stake a claim, you're a gold prospect. Yeah, well, I look for other things too. That's where I'm going. Yeah. So when you start to do some, I don't know if I'm going to use the right terminology, but when you start to do some exploration of the ground that yeah. you have staked, is there, do you have an order of what minerals you're looking for, or you're looking for anything that's Well, there? no, when you stake it, because certain minerals, you're looking for different things, different minerals. Okay. Like diamonds, for instance, like I say, it's a totally different beast. Gold's totally different than base metals. Well, would there, base metals are different than iron? Okay, uh, so if so, if you're metal. staking a claim, probably you're looking for gold. Yeah. What are the odds of finding something else in that? Uh, well, you know what's weird is that there's been a lot of mines found by companies looking for something, something totally else. different. Yeah. So I'll give you an example: Victoria Creek. Uh, there was a shaft there, uh, uh, you know, a head frame. Uh, they tore it down and moved it to another mine. This one never became a mine, but they spent a lot of money there, uh, I think 20 million bucks or something like that. And they were looking for diamonds. A mm. uh, company was looking for diamonds. Uh, I think it was Sudbury Contact. Anyway, uh, and then they ended up, uh, you know, they're doing sampling, uh, what they call till sampling. You sample the uh, base of till, you sample you know the what the glaciers leave behind mm -hmm. and usually if you have something in a bedrock source and then the glaciers come over it's gonna leave a trail because yeah. it's just gonna scour and then you know so then you you find certain minerals and you can track it back and that's how the first diamonds in north america were found a guy yeah. called charles fipke 
It was a one-man show up in the Northwest Territories. Everybody said, oh, you're never going to find diamonds in North America. But there were diamonds in the till. Mm. So he knew there was got to be a source. There's nobody bothered to deal. And they don't teach the in Canadian universe, at least not when I was there. They didn't mm-hmm. teach anything about diamonds because they just assumed you're never going to be looking for diamonds. Yeah. But anyway, the, so it's the same thing with gold. It, you know, you can get a trail of gold off of this. Well, anyway, they were looking for the diamond indicator minerals, and they hit gold. So they found Victoria Creek. There's out in Labrador, um, Voise Bay, it's a big mm-hmm. nickel deposit. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were looking for diamonds, I think. Uh, and uh, in that case, they were just kept flying over top of this, going back and forth to where they're checking out. And they kept seeing this thing sticking. It was all rusty and big gauzen. They call that a gauzen. Mm. And the guy, and it was the last day, they hadn't had much luck on the diamond front. And he said, uh, well, why don't we stop there? It's the last day. You know, We're going to be gone tomorrow. Let's take a sample of that, whatever it is, and turn it to be Boise Bay. So this happens all the time. Like they used to calibrate all the equipment up in Timmins. There's geophysical equipment that, you know, this is another thing that's happened in the last 50 years, let's say. Airborne geophysics, people see the helicopters and planes flying over and and they might be towing a, a piece of equipment or whatever. They're doing geophysical, they're looking for minerals. Uh, but up there they were calibrating their equipment. Uh, on this one spot because mm-hmm. uh, it was so strong. Okay. But they never drilled it. That was Kid Creek. <laughs> no kid. Yeah. No kid. They so for it. years they came, well, let's go over here, over here. We'll drill all these other things. <laughs> what the, the thing we're calibrating our equipment on is the strongest thing around, but uh, maybe we should drill that. <laughs> so there you go. I, I'll give you a story. It's like, there's lots of stories. There's a guy up in the... Uh, Red Lake, his Irish, old Irish guy. And uh, so this one was called the uh, Gold Eagle or Eagle Gold. Mm-hmm. It got taken out, the junior company got taken out for one and a half billion dollars uh, by Gold Corp. But the way that the deposit was discovered was he, it was winter time, he's drilling on this lake and they're drilling, they keep targeting this one area. And I don't know, somehow the drillers got mixed up and the the old Irish fellow was out on a toot, like a four day toot. He was he was drunk. He was done. He done. <laughs> so they went and drilled the opposite way, the wrong way. Okay. So by the time he came back, he was just freaking out. He's like, oh he just wasted this much money and mm-hmm. that's how he made the discovery. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> So oh, what you yeah. say is a lot of times it's better to oh, be yeah. flat out lucky than lucky good. than good. You betcha. <laughs> oh yeah. I still remember Stewie and myself at the Macassar there is the first zone of, of all the south zones that we found, the D zone. And it's the same thing we were told. Just drill this the main the O four break, which is what Macassar was built on. Mm-hmm. Just drill that. Don't do anything else. So Stewie and I are we were at the Bellevue and we're drawing a little things on napkins and everything we're going why don't we drill the other way there's a zone down there i can you know can almost feel it but there was one hole that kind of indicated some really low grade so yeah let's drill to the south we just won't tell them and the thing is if we had come up with a dud hole we would have been in big trouble yeah because each hole costs a lot of money mm. but we hit pay dirt right so the thing was though and you're a hero no but years later when we're mining it we find out if we had drilled five feet one side or five feet deeper, we would have missed it. Oh, really? Yeah, and then we would have been in big trouble. Big we would never been able to go back and drill nah, that and so. Nah, nah, yeah, was, that's nah. the way she goes. There is a uh, there is an interest, interesting story on how you guys name some of your finds and how you name oh, them at after after Rush songs. Well, you can name anything. You can name new discoveries after whatever you want. After what? But how did you, why Rush? Well, because uh, Stewie and I are big Rush fans. And, and we thought that down, the Prospector's Convention is the biggest thing in the world, right? 20,000 people. Yeah. And we always have a booth there. And we thought, well, if we name these these songs after, after uh, you know, Rush, Rush songs, then maybe they'll show, they'll show up. up, right? And uh, 
Now they never did, but I don't think they they found out about it because we didn't tell them or anything. Well, but now they know. Yeah, or now they do know because. Tell cause, this story now. Well, is this a classic story? Oh well, yeah. So you shall tell the story. So I'm, okay, yeah. So Blue Rodeo's in town, and but anyway, I don't know that. So I'm doing the. Well, I know they're in town, but uh, you know I don't know the. Man, the members of the this band that during the hundredth anniversary. Yeah, hundredth anniversary. So you're doing. So your we're thing doing. With Tolburn. We're doing the Tolburn thing and the panning, panning for, gold, for gold. And then the uh, Clarky comes over. He says, "Here, you, I got to. You got to talk to this guy. He's he's really interested in. Uh, he, he he's he's interested in the fact that you named these these zones after Rush songs because he's good friends with Getty. Like he's <laughs> like really close buds. Like, I don't know. They got they share their cottages are next door to each other or whatever. I go, oh wow, okay, sure. So I go over there and I'm talking to him and everything, and he, and I show him this and that and map show of all the maps, names yeah. and everything. He's like, oh, t tickle pink. He's going, oh, yeah, get. He's gonna love this. And then I go and uh, so I and then I I email it to him and I'm writing his name down and you know he's he's and I don't recognize because I'm not a. You know, so then I, I go, okay. I, he says, well, I'll see you at the, at the concert. I go, okay, sure. So I'm there at the concert and I'm, and I, I'm, lo I'm looking look around, around for, for the guy. guy. He's not there. And who comes up on stage? He's the guitarist. He's freaking <laughs> awesome. <laughs> He's like, freaking, holy jeez. So there you were. You had uh, the guitarist from Blue Rodeo <laughs> yeah. in your midst of Tobern and yeah. had no idea. No was. idea. Well, we had a beer. And, but that was it. <laughs> like, oh. That's a classic story. Yeah, I know. Um, in your humble opinion, uh, the future of Curtin Lake, what does it look like? Oh, yeah, it looks, well, I mean, you got to remember where we come from. 1999. Well, we come from holy, the ditch. Holy, holy. We came from the ditch. We yeah. are about as low economically I, as a town can go. I still remember Morally. being, I don't remember, I, we're at the Fed. And there's a guy, I forget who it was, and he's gone, ah, oh, this isn't a mining town anymore. This isn't a timber, lumber town. And you're not going to even notice when the casa closes. But when it did, holy cow, did you notice, did right? Did you ever notice? Yeah, so, no, no, it's, it's well, obviously they're sinking the new shop. They mm -hmm. wouldn't be doing that unless they thought there's lots of years ahead of them. And the, this new zone, it's got a lot of open territory to go, right? Okay. So... And it's not just that, there's other zones to the south of that, and blah, blah, blah. So, not to mention there's a, like, everything just stopped when it came to the other zones that we were looking at when we discovered the south zone. So there's all those other oh, zones. Okay. Yeah, because okay. well, you're not going to go after some skinny little thing that's high grade when yeah. you're going to have a massive high grade thing mm -hmm. in the south. So there's still so lots, there's still of lots of other things. That be and, yeah. Explored. So, and uh, oh, it's in good hands with Tony there. Tony's good mind manager. Uh, I'm just trying to think. Yeah, he's like uh, either he's my favorite. Well, he's my. I got it. I I really liked uh, Bill Glover as a mind manager. Okay. He, yeah. He was a good hands-on dude there. Uh, so they were my favorite mind managers. Because I've been, I've had a lot of mind managers I've worked for over the years. But uh, yeah, I know there's. Uh, there's, yeah, I like to say, there, I'm trying to think of some of the people that are uh, in, in, the, in the mines there. Like, you know, Ray Bilek was, you know what, for him to get, bring Mikasa back mm -hmm. from, and, and, the, and the things that they had to go through, I, I can't even remember the numbers, but the amount of water they had to pump out to, to dewater, to get yeah. down, to drill the, to the south, mm -hmm. and et cetera, it was something, it was in the billions of gallons. Wow. Like it was like, wow. it's, re it's amazing how much uh, water they had to pump and the amount of money. You know, most, you know, most companies would never have done Wouldn't that. Have done it. No. no, but Harry, Harry Dobson there, he, <clears throat> you know, he's a, you know, he, he's the wealthiest Scotsman around. But his wife Dawn is from Kirk and Lake. She just passed away, okay. eh? And she's originally from Kirk and Lake, so there was a connection there too, eh? So there's a lot of little connections. Mm -hmm. The D zone, by the way. Which is that one I was telling you yeah. about that we j we could have missed it by five feet, um, but we hit it. We called it the D zone. We we're talking about Tobern and uh, panning for gold with the kids during the anniversary. Oh, did they ever love that? Eh? It was a wonderful day in the park. Yeah. Um, one of the highlights of the anniversary celebrations was the unveiling of the prospector. Yeah, and, and his dog. Don't forget his dog, because his dog is what the kids love, right? For folks that 
did not have her opportunity to be on hand that day or maybe don't know yeah. about um, our latest tourist attraction here in town. Yeah. Why don't you uh, give us the background on it? Well, that, uh, you know, it's the, uh, I'm not sure whose idea originally it was, but it was a great idea. And, you know, it's the 100th anniversary committee was in there and then the Tolburn operating, operating authority, we, we had a sort of subcommittee and I headed that up and then, and then the thing was, we were originally going to, you know, we were trying to get, um, cause this is a, for posterity, it's a mm -hmm. historical thing, it's the 100th anniversary. Mm -hmm. So we did get from the federal government uh, uh, a grant, uh, paid for about half of it. Mm -hmm. And then, but we were hoping some, for something from the province, but uh, good luck with that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, we had to make that up and we were gonna, you know, do this and that, but um, Kirk and Gold came through big time and mm -hmm. paid for the rest of it. And that was really generous of them. But it, I gotta admit, it's a beautiful statue. It's got like the guy, and the guy who does the, or the artist, yeah. like he's got other statues around. He's got one in Liskard there, but the detail, you can see oh, the it's veins. Amazing. Oh, it's amazing. It's absolutely, if you haven't seen it, yeah. you gotta go by Tolburn Property yeah, Executive. Yeah, yeah. It's, and it's then, wonderful. Oh yeah, and you know, that's the, the idea. This 100th anniversary is a one-time thing, but that'll be there forever. I, I don't know what else from the, from the, yeah, from exactly. the thing will, will still be here like next year sort of thing. But um, by the way, here's a, well, it's got nothing to do with this, but I just, I just, it came to me there the other day. Uh, 100th anniversary, people, you know, born, brought up in Kern Lake and people like us who've moved here mm -hmm. and love it and, it, you know, it's home. But you realize that no one's born in Kirkland Lake anymore. So when the 200 thing. That's right. Nobody's born. Anymore. No, they got to be born in New Lister, Timmins or Lisker. Yeah. yeah. So I, I That's just, I true. can't fathom, That's like true. there's no grandkid of mine is going to be born in either That's of those very, two places. You know, <laughs> Can you know, think of the, I've think known of the that, but I've never, never quite thought of it in, yeah, in, yeah. in that way. But think of the, the I mean, the, the, think of the, the hockey, the, you know, the, yeah, the things that have gone on over the years oh, between us and, and Lisker and us and Timmins, and now our, our kid, our, our grandkids are gonna be all born in these places. <laughs> Holy Jesus. That's not right. That's not, not right at all. <laughs> that, that reminds me of another story. It involves a couple, I, I guess I can tell it, eh? but you can cut it out after or whatever. Sure, we can tell okay, it. Okay, anyway. So no, this but it- Tales from the Mile No, I know, okay. So there's a Dan McCormick who is a uh, mm -hmm. geologist and really good. I worked with him, great guy. and but he's a good hockey player and a yes, lot of these real good hockey a player. lot of these prospectors geologists are good hockey players mm -hmm. uh, you know so anyway dan was one of them and dan goes first year he's here i guess and who's uh on his team mookie who's you know <laughs> yeah. in the bush prospect and you know he was famous a lot famous for well you know we're dini petty where yeah the bear attacked him but everyone knows he actually attacked the bear um but yeah. <laughs> So, so anyway, uh, so Dan's Mookie's in the car driving down there, and uh, and there's and I guess the the coach is Sweats, right? Mm -hmm. And so so Dan's on the ice, and I guess Sweats had benched Mookie a couple times for taking, or benched him for taking two stupid penalties or whatever, Mookie. and then and then Mookie didn't like that, and just when Dan's going uh, skating near the bench of the Liskard coach. Uh, that's when Mookie and Sweat start punching each other. <laughs> and Dan hears the coach for Liskard go, and this is why I don't want to play Kirk and Lake. <laughs> <laughs> this is, that's a Dan, that's Dan's story. He'd steal uh, that from him. Dan was, but, Dan, Dan was yeah. a, heck of a guy. He was a heck of a hockey player. Too. Oh, yeah, yeah. I yeah. believe he, uh, he played his university hockey at Waterloo. Yeah. Well, there's lots of guys in them. Like, uh, you know, uh, 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 Oh, cheesy! He, mm -hmm. he he made almost made the NHL, the and, Flyers right? And and you know he's worked in the mining industry, and uh, well, everybody. Dave Gamble was a good hockey mm -hmm. player. Uh, uh, Ken Kirkaway, uh, uh, all these guys are. Uh, Stewie played hockey. All these guys play hockey and whatnot. So tell us about your hockey career. Two goals. Eight years. <laughs> <laughs> I was proud of those two goals. Okay, some of us suck. <laughs> but we love it, but we suck. 
and you can remember both goals. I See, can now, remember not everyone, every. Not everyone can remember every goal they ever oh, scored. Right? I still remember that one that went. I, I was a slap shot from the point and it went ding, 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 <laughs> ding off all these people and into the net and everyone looked back at me like, you're kidding, you scored? <laughs> anyway, but uh, no, yeah, but uh, so uh, what else was going to mention there about uh, connection with hockey? Well, like I like say, I mean, I was at that Irish reunion, Holy Name Irish. Yeah. Yes, you, you know, like, Kurt and Lake used to have all the hockey players that, you know, they were all working. And in the, going back to yeah. the days of uh, Lakeshore Mines, they, yeah. won the, they won the Allen Cup in 1940. And, yeah, and yeah. Whatnot. But what I, what I wanted to ask is with, the, uh, with this monument, yeah. the Tober, with the prospector and his dog, yeah. there's all kinds of, I call them nuggets, there's all kinds of little hints that will remind oh, yeah. old-time prospectors of old-time prospectors. Yeah, but I can't say, because we've got to let people find them for themselves. So but they're right on the They're statue. plain and obvious. Yeah, yeah. So there's little things there. Okay, so how but, many... But, I mean, I wanted to add a few more. I just, there wasn't any more room. And How many little things should people but, look for if they go out, without revealing what they oh, are? Oh, I can't remember. You can't remember? No, I, I don't know. There's I can't remember. Handful, yeah, there's, yeah, there's, there's, oh, there's handful, some good there's good things on there, yeah. So yeah, and each one of those things, like there's, there's start even the dog himself. I mean, obviously Rosa Brown had her yeah. herd of dogs there going through town and that, eh? and she's prospector. I mean, she made most of her well, money on prospector. real estate. You, that. you ever have a dog in the bush with you? Uh, I haven't, but you know, Tommy O'Connor does all the time. Yeah. A lot of guys yeah, do. Tommy does you know, in the old days, it wasn't. I tell you, like, uh, was it I don't know protection? if the guys still do, but I mean, in, it, it, there was a time there where a lot of guys had a pistol with them, mm -hmm. right? And of course, they come out of the bush. The first thing they wanted was a beer. They'd come into the bar, and they'd still have their pistol on, it, you know. But they'd have them hidden. But was the dog companion or protection? Well, they're both. They're both. Yeah. Okay. How many countries have you prospected in? Oh, geez. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. Every time I go on vacation, by the way. <laughs> So, well, yeah, I could be lying on a beach or I could go do some prospecting. I like <laughs> <laughs> No, but, you know, I don't know, a bunch anyways, uh, eight or nine. But. Now, to prospect, we'll call it overseas. Um, yeah, but I don't know. permits and I stuff? Don't, I don't hold claims. I just, you know, went out check things out for the companies I was so, working with. Okay, with. so you're but, not actually but I'll, I'll tell staking you, claims in other countries? No, okay. but you know, each each country has its own thing in the bush, right? So when I was in Zimbabwe and, and Southern Af in South Africa, mm -hmm. you'd be walking through the bush and what you got to watch out for, you know, because we don't have a lot of poisonous snakes you have to uh, worry yeah. about here. Mm -hmm. There you do. And uh, like the poison, the most poisonous one, the black mamas, you don't really have to worry because they can hear you come and they're going to bugger off. Okay. It's these puff adders. And these puff adders are lazy snakes. And they'll just sit there until you step on them. Then they tag, tag you. Oh, wow. So you see what I got? I got snake boots here. Eh? That's why you have Yeah, snake I got boots. the snake boots just in case. But I use these here because they're nice and light. Eh? They were different and colors, and different color. We call them go-go boots. Yeah, that's what the wee well, woman calls them, were... yeah. They had some tassels and yeah. later we call them wrestling boots. Yeah, <laughs> she calls them that too. Anyway, I like because you, you can go in the water up to here and you don't you know you don't get wet. So, no, and they're light, eh? Not that you could ever outrun a bear, but you like to think you could, you know. Just saying. So, the city kid coming out of me again. Um, so you encounter a bear, we know you're supposed to make a bunch of noise, try and frighten the bear. Oh, no. Yeah, that's one thing. But the biggest thing you're supposed to do, the first thing you're supposed make to do, big. that's the one, right? So again, it was a CBC story. Oh, I don't want to tell you that one because that one's gross. Well, maybe I will. Okay, so, so there's a guy and he's got, you know, um, it's a true story. The guy was, you know, being interviewed. Anyway, he's got uh, bear bait. Like, he, mm -hmm. guys, you know, he takes people out, but he's going to check his bear bait. His wife is in the truck, lets him out at the highway. He walks in, and the first bear bait place isn't too far in, right? Mm -hmm. 
and uh, he feels like something's following him, but he, you know, he that, that, you know. So he gets to the bear bait, and he turns around, nothing's there, and he sits down to have a smoke, and then all of a sudden the birds stop chirping, uh -oh. and he knows there's something behind him. He turns around, there's a bear, and he means business. So he he runs a certain distance, but he picks up a big branch. And the bear was going towards him, but he picks up the big branch, and that scared the bear away because they have bad uh, eyesight. They don't. They, they're, they, it's all the smell is there, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, the bear went away, but then he turned around, and then he comes at him, going through the bush, going through things, the saplings. They're just coming right at him. So he goes, well, he's got no choice now. He's got to climb a tree, but he knows the bear can climb a tree. tree. Sure yeah. enough, he's up in the tree. He's out in a limb, and he's kicking the bear, and the bear's gouging him and this and that. And uh, I guess the bear got so close to him, he, he had his, a big lighter, and he, and he burnt the bear's eye. But then he fell to the, because now he's bleeding, and he fell to the next branch, and the bear comes down to that branch. Then he falls down to the ground. And the bear comes down. Now he says, well, he, he figures he's done, yeah. right? He's bear circling him, won't, won't do anything. And he figures, well, maybe it's because he burned his eye and he's just going to wait till he dies, right? And he figures, okay, well, I'm done. And he remembers he's got a cell phone. So he phones his wife and everyone comes around. <laughs> and he's like, I wasn't expecting You didn't that expect that ending. ending. I didn't expect that ending. It's true. <laughs> there you go. Let's go, well, while I'm waiting here and the bear's circling around me, I may as well use, as well use cell my cell phone. <laughs> uh, yeah. But anyway, there you go. See, bears won't, uh, they'll wait. They know you're going to die. They're just going to let you die because they're not, they don't want to take, you know, exert themselves any more than they have to. So, okay, so bear protection. Make yourself big, make a bunch of noise if you have yeah. to run. Well, you're, you're not going to outrun it, and you can't, like you heard, can't go I've, up a tree. I've heard a myth of running uphill. Wow. If there's a hill to run up. I don't know. I don't know. But, or do you run but down, I'll tell you do what. Do you run downhill? And then there, if you, you, top heavy if you have the bear spray, uh, you know, like Mike Leahy says that, you know, you ever see a bear or you hear about it, but you ever see it where they go right into the, you know, to get honey, mm -hmm. and they're getting stung. Yeah. They don't matter. care. Yeah, they don't care. So, you know, pepper spray, how do you know it works? Because maybe people who use it, they can't talk about it. But, yeah, I got them right in the face. Didn't seem to work because they're not around. Now, you know, but, but anyway, I know one thing. That stuff works. It's horrible on people. And half the time, you know, people spray themselves. So yes. I, I had one on my belt, and I didn't notice that the, the, there's a latch or a safety thing on there. came off, and all of a sudden it sprayed. Oh, no. So I'm like, oh, I got it on my hands, right? So then, and I'm getting black flies in my eyes, so oh, I wash no. my hands, but I, so I thought I got I thought. it off. I go and I put my finger in my eye, and now my mm. eye is burning, and mm -hmm. like, you can't get that out, right? Mike Sutton joining us on Tales from the Mile of Gold. Mike, it's been a pleasure. It's been a okay. whole lot of fun, man. Some great right. stories. And uh, maybe we'll uh, reconvene another day, and we'll thanks, tell hey. the second half of the stories. Yeah, well, I got lots more. Thanks, eh? Thanks again. Uh.